Okay, folks, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, this is Mike Sarnowski. I'm a uh, Vice President of Sports here at Special Olympics Maryland. Uh, we're going to be joined tonight by a couple different folks uh, to help uh, review bocce. Some of this, uh, I think for some of you who have done who have coached sports uh, for um, uh, earlier in the year or in the fall, uh, there'll be some redundancy, although there are some updates. Did want to mention that this week is Spread the Word Week. And um, uh, if you uh, have a chance, uh, you can go visit the um, Spread the Word Inclusion uh, site. That's, uh, you can get right from our main website. Uh, also, there is a, um, uh, we're having our Over the Edge uh, event. Uh, um, one coming up in Montgomery County, another one coming up in Columbia, um, and some information there about uh, uh, some raffle and, and opportunity uh, things. Just go to www.overtheedgemd.com. So that said, we'll go ahead again. Ryan, uh, I believe George uh, and Rennie and Steve is here as well. Um, uh, we'll be going through. So um, just a couple reminders as we're going through and doing Zoom, although I'm sure everybody here has become a bit of an expert with it. Um, uh, you can use the chat feature. We'll probably use that a couple times. That's a good way to put a question in there. Uh, if we're doing okay time-wise, we do have a lot to cover. Um, we may open it up for you to ask verbally. Uh, you can also raise your hand. Uh, that raise hand symbol there, uh, you need to be showing your um, the participants window, which you can do uh, using with the little command bar uh, that's there. Um, if you can see, uh, actually you can't see mine, but anyhow, uh, that's there as well. We're gonna go through the return to activities protocol uh, and requirements and such, talk about a bit about that, specifically about bocce, um, go over some uh, uh, information about bocce itself. Uh, the season, we're hopeful that we'll be able to have some type of season with bocce and hopefully to have some type of competition with that as well. Um, we're not going to go into the resources. You're very familiar with that. That's a whole section that shows you all the different different forms and so on down the line, but we wanted to make sure you know that that's there. We're not actually going to review that as a part of tonight's agenda. So, um, so let's dive right in. The, um, uh, the document you see there is our return to activities protocol. Uh, that's based on information that's been provided to us by uh, Special Olympics North America and Special Olympics uh, Incorporated. Uh, and there's some subsections, as you can see down at the bottom there, uh, for some individual sports. Not every sport has an individual um, uh, specific section. I'm not sure if Bocce does or not, uh, but um, that's available on our Return to Activity uh, website, which you'll see several times, several links in here. Uh, and it'll, of course, be in the materials that Ryan sends subsequent to tonight's session. Some things, uh, and there, there, some of these are going to be repeated throughout, and that's okay. It, uh, um, it certainly helps with um, uh, making sure that everything is uh, solid. Uh, so if you get nothing else from tonight, be sure to talk to your area leadership, your area director and your area leadership have had uh, been going over this for um, now almost a year um, or in various iterations here. Uh, they, um, uh, they're making decisions on behalf of your area uh, and they are very well informed and can help or they can access that, uh, the, uh, the information and get that for you. Um, you're not gonna start your bocce program without the approval of your area director. Um, then, uh, and also I should say, as we're going through and you see some of the protocols, it may be that you decide that, uh, or your area decides that it's just not ready to do uh, an in-person bocce program. Um, and that's okay. Uh, we hope many uh, do opt to as things seem to be getting a little better um, as uh, time uh, progresses, but that's okay. The protocols that we're sharing here, these are not suggestions. These are not recommendations. They are absolute requirements. And in some cases they may be changing. Uh, at various points. Um, uh, it's pretty stable, although there is one change uh, that uh, we'll be talking with the areas about on Monday uh, that I'll allude to when we get to that. Um, again, the most recent activities protocols available on that site. Um, while we're doing this, uh, all the same requirements in terms of athlete medicals, volunteer certs and applications are still required. Uh, in fact, if you're doing um, training virtually, using the virtual training guide that's been produced for bocce uh, or uh, whatever, or you're doing it in person, that's all required there. Right now, 
every local program is in what we call phase one. We'll talk about the phases in a moment, but we're in phase one and we'll progress from there. Uh, and um, so uh, I. Hopefully, I'm sorry. Oh, Actually, so if you could, um, if everybody could mute themselves, that would be helpful. Oh. Or if Steve, if you could do that, just so we're, uh, you know, we certainly don't want to hear uh, talk with you, but we do uh, need to kind of plow through a little bit of stuff uh, as we go through. So thank you. Um, and, yeah. So, and as I mentioned, this is an evolving process, so there'll be different updates. We have one that we know of that's coming up uh, on Monday with, uh, that again, we'll share with the areas then. And I mentioned about the site that's there as well. Um, and again, you'll see that many times. Uh, for your athletes, we have uh, Jeff Abel um, and his team recorded three separate webinars. Uh, these are not repeats of each other. They sort of build on each other. So it's recommended if your athletes watch these to do it in that order uh, that you see there. Uh, you have the links here in the slide deck. The links are also on the Return to Activities site as well. Uh, and um, uh, we encourage you to do that. In addition, uh, uh, Jeff is looking to host, I don't think he has the date set yet, but looking to host some additional live sessions for athletes. Uh, and as soon as that, uh, those dates and the links are available, they will certainly be shared. Those can be great opportunities for um, uh, to help your athletes understand and your family members for that matter, and potentially coaches and other volunteers to, to better understand what all the protocols are with here. So, um, uh, but again, we'll, uh, as we have more information on those live sessions, uh, they'll be available. I'm sure there's gonna be pushed out to everybody, but they're also available on the return to activities page. Um, these uh, protocols that we're sharing here apply to all in-person activities where athletes are present. So whether we're talking a practice session or a training session, competitions, if we're able to hold some, uh, meetings, et cetera, on down the line, anywhere, anything that's in person, these protocols um, follow. I mentioned the fact that they are required. It's not an optional. We'll be sharing, like I say, the protocols that Special Olympics has. However, we also need to factor in uh, the whatever requirements are there for the state of Maryland, for your local jurisdiction, and potentially for the facility that you're using. Uh, and whichever of those is the most restrictive is what we need to follow. Um, so in some cases, uh, our protocols may be the most restrictive. In some cases, the state, um, in fact, actually for some cases, it was definitely the state uh, of Maryland uh, had a more restrictive in terms of numbers and so on. Um, so whichever is the most restrictive will be what's in place. And of course, again, your area leaders will know that uh, and will be able to share, uh, to help you with that. You may see that some other groups, school systems, uh, for example, our high school um, interscholastic sports program, um, they're following the high school uh, regulations and guidelines. They're running that program essentially independently um, uh, these seasons. Uh, and so they're gonna follow their own guidelines. So they may be doing something a little different than what we're sharing here, and that's okay, doesn't mean that you can change what you're doing. You need to follow these guidelines since this is under the auspices of Special Olympics. Um, and again, I mentioned it's not, you're not re required to return to activity right away. Talk with your area director. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're hopeful that we'll have a number of programs operating and it's gonna vary not just by area, but also by sport in many cases as well. So I mentioned about the phases. Uh, it's a four-phase program with three numbered phases. Uh, so phase zero was when we first started out like about a year ago, uh, when basically nothing was going on. All the areas right now, all the counties, are in what we call phase one, where there is a limited opportunity to have in-person activity. Uh, with that, so that means if you are having uh, that programming, uh, it's 10 or fewer participants at a time. Now, when we say participants, I, it doesn't say athletes, it says participants. So that includes your athletes, your unified partners, your coaches, your volunteers. If you have family members who are hanging around near the, um, in, or in the proximity of the, uh, the training location, they count against that total of 10 as well. Um, so in many cases, it may be that there are no spectators or there are no family members allowed uh, to be in that immediate vicinity. It is possible in a larger facility to have more than one group of 10, but they need to be physically separated and not intermingled. Um, 
physically separated, we say, you know, at least 50 feet, maybe even more uh, if you can. In addition, in phase one, uh, social distancing of a minimum of six feet needs to be maintained at all times. Uh, short of an emergency, we don't want you to, you know, if an athlete's hurt, of course, uh, treat the athlete. But other than that, uh, they need to be uh, uh, six feet apart at all times. There can be no direct or indirect contact. When we say direct contact, that means one person touching another person. Um, so that can be a challenge if you're trying to, to train someone how to deliver a ball and you need to move, uh, you would typically, I should say, move their arm through the motion. Um, you wouldn't be able to touch them. And also you need to be six feet away too. Um, uh, also in phase one, no indirect contact. And indirect contact is when a person touches an object, say a bocce ball, uh, and then another person touches that object without it being sanitized between. Um, so that uh, it's not certainly not impossible to operate that way, but it can add some challenges. It may mean having more, more sets of balls present or each athlete have their own ball, et cetera, for bocce, but uh, that's uh, the standard that we have there. And then again, no sharing of equipment. In addition, throughout uh, for phase one, at every practice, there's a, a what we call a pre-event screening that needs to take place. Uh, and um, uh, we'll talk through that in, in a moment with that. Um, when we get to phase two and not, uh, I mean, those areas who had been in phase two in the fall, once there've been enough uh, days of a certain level of, um, of incidence of COVID in, the, uh, in their county uh, can potentially go to phase two. At that point, the group size for, uh, per Special Olympic standards can go up to 50 people. And again, that counts everybody who's in that vicinity. Um, but again, it also can vary based on whatever the state of Maryland or your local jurisdiction is allowing. Uh, I have to be honest and tell you, I don't know. I think the state of Maryland is still capped at 25, although that might be 25 for indoor activities. Whatever they have, that's what the cap is, or, you know, or whichever one is more restrictive, I should say. With there as well, again, uh, the, the cap is 50 people. The physical distancing of a minimum of six feet still in place. Um, and you can still not have any direct contact, again, person touching another person, although indirect contact can be allowed. And then again, we have the screening in place. The phase three is when things are virtually back to normal uh, and then they all lift. You'll notice across the bottom, we have a double headed arrow as has happened uh, in the fall and actually into nope. here, you can progress up through the, um, uh, the different phases uh, and, um, and advance on, uh, no one's got, of course, gotten beyond phase two at this moment, but then things can change as it did when we had that uh, bit of a spike or the, the third wave, I think that, that it was, and then move back down to phase one. So it's gonna be very varying and sometimes uh, that can just be uh, terribly disappointing. So with that in mind, uh, what we want to do is just, let's just do a, um, uh, well, actually, I'll show you. This is in there. I'm not going to go through it. This basically repeats what was there. For some folks, this is a little bit easier to capture and to, to look at. Um, uh, and again, you'll get these slides, so you'll have that. Uh, but uh, that's there for you. What I would like you to do, if you could, uh, is uh, have Steve launch that poll, the first poll. Steve, you're the one who has to do it. Yep. And there we go. Okay. So if you could read down through there, uh, and what we want you to identify is what are those things that are permitted when a program is in phase one? And I'm sorry, I'm turning my head to you uh, to see the poll. I have to look at my other monitor that's over here. So again, um, read through those. You may have to scroll down, but when you're done answering the question, uh, and checked it off, please hit submit. Okay, and uh, let's just take a minute or so for that. And Steve, I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 11. I see 12 people uh, who potentially could answer, plus another third, another one who's just on the phone. So. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, we're at eight, eight right now. Okay, let's just take another uh, 15 seconds or so. Um, ah. <laughs> okay. 
And Steve, let's go ahead and close that and show the results. Let's see how we did. Okay, yep. Uh, coach can't guide the athlete through perfect, can't uh, uh, hand equipment off. Um, the coach uh, can demonstrate a skill from a distance uh, of six feet or eight feet there. Um, can use poly spots. In fact, we'll see that in a video starring several of uh, the nationwide video, but it's all starring a lot of Maryland athletes. Um, can't throw the football back and forth because of indirect contact with that. Uh, let's see. They can be shooting at an open soccer goal. Uh, they may have to retrieve their ball and such, but it's an open goal. Uh, and then, uh, right, they, if you have a goalie or an assistant coach in the goal, uh, that makes it uh, in phase one, not allowed because there's indirect contact uh, with that. Okay, Steve, let's toss up the next one, the second poll. We're only gonna do two at this, uh, at this point. Uh, we'll have another one a little later on. And what do we got there? Yeah, it's it's um, directing me back to poll one, Mike. Is there? There should be an option at the top to select. There should be a drop down with polls. Yep, that's it. Perfect, Steve. Thank you. Uh, it looks like we just didn't have them labeled. That's all. That's okay. So, of the folks that are listed there, the different people or group of groups of people, who is counted towards that maximum allowed? Uh, for any phase, whether it's the 10 when we're in phase one or the maximum of 50 when we're in phase two or whatever the total happens to be if the state or the local jurisdiction cuts that down. So check off all of those that would be counted towards that total um, that you need to maintain. And again, as, as the first poll, hopefully you can scroll down and hit submit. We've got 10 in, 11, so 12. So I think Let's that's go. That sounds good. Go ahead and show it. Okay, great. Yep. Uh, those first four, absolutely. Uh, the volunteers as well, um, that they're there. Again, if they're in the training location, if they're somewhat removed, uh, for example, we'll see with uh, some volunteers who are doing the check-in and that check-in might be, or checking in and doing the screening, that might be physically removed from where the actual training is going on. So that might not be included. Uh, family members who stay in their car uh, absolutely would not be counted. So um, nice to be cautious there, but, um, but yeah, if they're in their car and away from the, part, from the, uh, the training, uh, they don't count towards your total. However, if they come to the training location, uh, the next one, and almost everyone got that one right, um, they would be counted towards it. And then the last one, uh, yeah, if they're, uh, those who observe from a distance, I think it says 50 meters away, um, yeah, they, they're far enough away that they would not be counted uh, towards that. They're, they're uh, at a good distance from that. Okay, so let's go ahead and close that and we'll move along. So I'm not gonna read through this for you, but this is a really good resource. It's across two pages and it is included, I think as a single page uh, in that um, return to activities protocol guide that you can uh, get from our site. And I do encourage you to get it and read through it. But this kind of gives you a nice little set of guidance on uh, depending upon the phase that you're in, what you need to do with compliance uh, in general, uh, for the education, there's some great pointers here of things to go over with your athletes, your coaches, your family members in advance prior to attendance. Everybody's getting so used to doing things via Zoom. This might be an excellent opportunity uh, to use Zoom or another provider um, before you start practice or before you start in-person practice to meet with everyone and go through all of the things that are going to be required because let's be honest, it may be the case that some of your athletes may not be able, some of your coaches as well, may not be able to, um, to adhere to what they need to adhere to in terms of the social distancing and such. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it may be until things are back to normal that that athlete uh, may or may not be able to participate or at least not in that particular sport. So, um, but the education gives you a nice thing to go through with that um talks through different preparations and such again you read this on your own and it's, it'll be in the deck that you get from ryan but it'll also be in that uh that guide we mentioned uh and then um uh the activity talks through that with there so uh let's 
we'll let this going. And Steve, if you could just give me a thumbs up, assuming you can hear, uh, I think I checked off the right thing. In order to safely return to activity, Special Olympics recommend that participants wear a mask if on public transport, such as a bus, trolley, subway, or if carpooling with someone not living with them. If Special Olympics is providing transportation, face masks during travel and maintaining physical distance are required. Prior to entering any activity, practice, event, or gathering, all athletes, coaches, unified partners, volunteers, family members, and caregivers must participate in an on-site screening. It is important to take the necessary steps to create a safe on-site screening area. One, create a single point of entry. One entryway that allows participants to enter one at a time. Remember, we strongly advise outdoor spaces only in phase one. Two, use chalk, tape, cones, or other markers to indicate what six feet or two meters looks like for physical distancing. Three, Make sure you have all the necessary supplies for a proper screening, which include temporal thermometer, pens, masks, gloves, disinfectant wipes or spray, hand sanitizer, COVID-19 participant code of conduct and risk assessment forms. Volunteers will fill out a monitoring form for each participant that passes through screening. The form includes the participant's name, contact info, temperature, answers to screening questions, and the outcome of the screening. For instance, can they participate or have they been isolated and sent home? Next, you will ask each participant the following required screening questions. We recommend using visual aids when asking the questions. One, in the last 14 days, have you had contact with someone who has been sick with COVID-19? Two, have you had a fever in the last week? Temperature of 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, 37.8 degrees Celsius, or higher. Three, do you have a cough and or difficulty breathing? Four, do you have any other signs or new symptoms of COVID-19? Fatigue, muscle or body aches, headache, new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, congestion or runny nose, nausea or vomiting or diarrhea in the past 14 days have you had contact with someone who has been sick with COVID? yes yes you have okay so i would actually have you step down here if a participant answers yes to any questions they must be isolated from the group sent home and instructed to contact their health care provider participants who are found to have COVID 19 symptoms must wait seven days after symptoms resolve to return to activity or must provide written proof of physician clearance to Special Olympics to return to activity. Participants who test positive or have COVID-19 must provide written medical clearance before returning to sport and fitness activities. After answering the screening questions, you will conduct on-site measurement of participants' temperatures using a thermometer, preferably a non-touch thermal scanning one if possible. If the thermometer is not available, you must ask participants to self-monitor and provide results of that monitoring. If there are any concerns about fever, temperature of 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, 37.8 degrees Celsius or higher, the participant should not be allowed to remain on site. If high, you may retest the participant after five minutes to ensure temperature is accurate. Record all names, results and contact information using the template provided and keep in case needed for contact tracing or reporting. For more information on Special Olympics return to activity protocol and safety guidelines, visit resources.specialolympics.org or consult your local program. There we go. So this just reviews those four questions. Um, and you saw, I, I don't know if you recognize Jeff there, uh, Jeff Abel, our, our VP of Local Program Development. Uh, in the, uh, the, the guide, 
that you uh, that you can download uh, or the the protocol. There are some tools that are there. Um, really recommend printing out um, that uh, that red sheet, if you will, that has all the different symptoms on it. I know I've checked in or handled check in on a couple different events that we've had, uh, and that was very very helpful. Uh, and just for um, uh, pointing out for athletes and so on down the line. But one of the key things that's there, and that's in that little pinkish box, if you will, when we're talking about these symptoms, we're talking about things that are new for the athlete, if, uh, if, or not just the athlete, the individual, I should say. Uh, if that person has a chronic condition, as an example, I have chronic sinus problems. I am always, <laughs> Oh, excuse me, going to have congestion. <laughs> Pick a day, I've got it now. That's never going away. Uh, uh, asthma, so on down the line. Um, you know, if it's a chronic situation, uh, then no, that doesn't count against them. It's if anything's new or different for them with that. So there's that one caveat when we say all the answers must be no, it's with that part uh, in mind. And then again, with the temperature check. With the temperature check also, um, you may, depending upon where you're located uh, your, or your training is located, if it's a healthy walk from, from the parking lot to where you, uh, you practice, you may have folks who just get a little overheated with that. That's one reason why we want to be sure uh, that they have that um, uh, little cool down opportunity uh, if they test high. Uh, and uh, that tends to work. Or if they're carrying a heavy equipment bag, I don't know if you, if you have somebody for bocce carrying your sets of bocce balls or whatever, or Lord, uh, carrying uh, the PVC bocce quartz. Yes, you will get <laughs> a little bit high. Your temperature will go up from that. Um, but yeah, so that's why we want to give them that chance. You definitely will get overheated with that. So that said, Steve, why don't we launch that the last poll? Um, and here, if I remember correctly, um, there's a whole series of, of statements that we want you to check off all of them that are true. Okay. Let's see how we do on that. Having that slide there might, might help with some of the answers, I'm not sure. Okay, Steve, how are we doing number wise? We've got about one or two more people. So we'll get about 10 more seconds here. Okay five more seconds and it looks like we've got them in there you go let's show that okay yep um again good first question is our first item is not true have to answer all of them uh all of them no with that caveat that i just described there um uh, again the the re retest on the temperature perfect uh, it's not just athletes and partners. It is everyone who's in that uh, that area there. Um, no touch, uh, absolutely. Uh, and um, uh, we didn't touch that there or mention it there, but having the pre-screening area close to a parking area is a really good idea uh, on the chance that you maybe need to send someone home uh, because they, um, uh, they either answered uh, yes to one of the questions or had a high temperature even after the recheck. And uh, again, depending upon your facility, it's a lot easier if they're right there with their car uh, and such. So cool. Um, thank you. Let's cruise along. Um, so we mentioned about everyone right now is in phase one. Um, we are not going to, uh, for well, in, in theory, or at least under the original setup, you have to be in phase one and operating in phase one for a minimum of two weeks. If your area had made it into phase two previously uh, and had uh, gone to that level, because again, it's your, is your area ready for it as well? Uh, as soon as the conditions allow, you would be able to go to phase two. And that's something that your area director and uh, Jeff and his team will work out uh, as far as that goes. As it stands, uh, at least as of the other day, everybody was still in phase one. I don't think anybody, a couple areas or a couple counties were getting at least the incidence um, of it's the number of cases, active cases uh, out of 100,000 in the population. Um, uh, so um, a couple were getting close to where they could 
um, look at that. So um, uh, again, we're uh, adjusting up uh, and changing that. You've got those there, a reminder about whatever is most restrictive. It's your area leadership along with headquarters, who's going to make uh, the decisions on what phase um, that's there. And it's going to vary area by area. It could also vary uh, sport by sport within your area as well. Um, uh, and, and so a lot of that may depend upon the facility, may depend upon you know, if they're, who's doing the screening and maintaining that. Uh, hopefully, it's not the coaches. Uh, I think in most cases, uh, areas have been able to identify other individuals to take care of the screening and that part of it rather than the coach, um, which is great. That's the way it should be. That may not be the case everywhere. Um, so, uh, you know, depending upon what we've got going there, it, it could vary uh, again, area by area and sport by sport. So if they have a failed screening, if they answer yes, they need to then, uh, and again, you can read this at your leisure, uh, they need to be free of symptoms for at least seven days after. So, so I'm not sure why it's worded this way, but it's the way we have to put it. Essentially, 14 days symptom free, or can have uh, written proof from a physician uh, that it's okay to return or a negative test, whatever, saying that it's okay for them to go. If they've actually tested positive for COVID, they ne definitely need a medical clearance before they can return to activities. Uh, with that, since, since there can be a long, depending upon how severe the case is, there can be a long tail, if you will, of their, um, uh, of their recovery. Acknowledgement of risk. So we're going to talk through this a little bit. This is the one thing I mentioned earlier, talk about a, 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 um, things potentially changing. Uh, we got notice today of a change in the form that's going to be used with this. Uh, that um, we'll be talking with our area leaders on Monday. We need to have it go through our legal folks first, but we'll talk about that. Conceptually, this all still applies the same, uh, and we'll, um, uh, we'll just uh, work with the, uh, any adjusting in form. So there is uh, uh, the current version of it is available both in that guide as well as uh, on, um, uh, on the website, on the coach resource page as well. Um, that describes uh, high risk populations, what the, um, uh, what the concerns can be for that, what appropriate behaviors are, actually serves as a little COVID code of conduct, if you will, uh, that's there. Uh, and, that, and indicating that if they can't adhere to those behaviors, athlete, coach, volunteer, family member, anybody in that area, that they may be asked to leave. Um, each person will be required to sign a document to that effect. Um, and then uh, those need to be scanned and sent into headquarters. Your area leadership will, will typically handle that for you. You wouldn't necessarily be doing that as a coach unless you have that role in addition within your area leadership for that. So, um, and we need to get those within a week uh, of that person's first activity. We're tracking this uh, in GMS and such. Um, for these, uh, this may vary a little bit, but there's, um, in theory, no expiration date unless uh, the person who, when they have it signed, is a minor, and then they need to redo it at their 18th birthday. Uh, but again, the, the, there's a little, some change that's happening with that, and we'll go over that, and we'll certainly share that with all coaches once we've uh, got it nailed down and share it with the area directors. Um, here's uh, it, just a listing of uh, things that they're saying. Uh, that they acknowledge that they, you know, I know before and when I get to a Special Olympics activity, they're going to ask me these questions. I agree to keep uh, at least six feet or two meters from participants at all times, so on down the line. So they're acknowledging that. Um, and then uh, as is the as will be the case um, with whatever change, the, um, the only thing that we need is the signed form, the signed document for that. Uh, and again, that uh, will go through all that uh, with any changes that are there. Um, it's actually a three-page document. The first page um, uh, also covered uh, some uh, things to consider as a high-risk individual uh, or who might be a high-risk individual. This lists several of those things there in, a different, in addition to age or living in any kind of a long-term uh, care facility, including a group home uh, environment that uh, categorizes you. Um, and then uh, also you know, some of the other conditions there that could potentially be problematic. Um, we are not saying 
to our athletes or our volunteers or coaches that if you are in any of those high risk situations that you cannot participate. We are saying that you might want to consider not participating, but it's your choice. And by signing uh, the document, uh, that will take care of that. Um, and and uh, we can move forward on that. So um, there's also uh, a log that needs to be taken place. I mentioned with the um, the, uh, the, the form that each person fills out, uh, they only need to do that once. This log needs to be captured for every practice. There's a certain form that's there. Again, you can download it from the coach resource page, and it's also in, the, um, in that protocol guide. Uh, you have to use that form. Please do not, please do not create uh, you know, something that you think is easier to use. We need a consistent when we're getting stuff potentially from uh, you know, 40, 50, 60 different programs every week, we need a consistent format. What you can do is, again, this is, it doesn't look exactly like this, but this is essentially what it looks like. You can pre-populate those things, uh, like the name, their role, their contact information, and whether they've turned in their form. Um, you can pre-populate that and then just print that off. The things that you're gonna be checking each time, unless they're a new person that's getting at it, is did they get screened? Yes, 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 they should all be yes. Uh, and whether they had any symptoms uh, with that or uh, said, uh, you know, could answer those questions properly. Um, again, each session, uh, and then uh, we need to get that again through your area leadership, because uh, there's a certain naming convention or all sorts of stuff like that. But anyway, they, we have to get those within a week of each practice session. Um, so again, these are all available uh, on uh, the coach resource page uh, and, and in that guide and such with that. So again, but as you can hear throughout this, you need to have a really good connection with your area leadership if you're gonna be successful and actually be able to operate whether we're talking phase one or phase two. And hopefully throughout any phase, even when we're not dealing with COVID, you have a great relationship with your area leadership. Okay. Let's see another short video. Menu to safely welcome Special Olympics participants is vital for return to activity for phases one and two. Arrive early to prepare the space. Start by ensuring the venue is disinfected or sanitized, especially the bathrooms and other high-touch areas. Wear disposable gloves for all tasks in the cleaning process, including the handling of trash. After sanitizing the space, set up signage that reinforces proper hygiene procedures, physical distancing, and wearing personal protective equipment, or PPE. Post signs in easy-to-understand language with visual cues in highly visible locations, like entrances and restrooms. The signs should describe how to stop the spread of germs by properly washing hands, following physical distancing guidelines, and explaining how to properly wear a cloth face cover. Also, make sure hand sanitizer and or hand washing facilities or stations are available. Lastly, set up a single entry with screening and a single exit area, which means there should be one entrance into the venue and one exit out of the venue that allows participants to be at least two meters or six feet apart. For more information on Special Olympics Return to Activity Protocol and Safety Guidelines, visit resources.specialolympics.org or consult your local program. Okay, and I should note that the, the resources at specialolympics.org, that's the, uh, the SOI resources and such, which is fine. Uh, the stuff that's, that's specific to Maryland or has been adapted specifically to Maryland is available on our return to activity page. And that's throughout all these documents. Um, we have, uh, so areas, uh, programs in order to operate need to have those items that are there, masks in case someone either forgets theirs or um, it gets damaged or something like that. It's uh, mud on it or something. Uh, no touch thermometers, hand sanitizer, disinfectant solution, gloves, not latex due to latex allergies, but vinyl gloves. Um, or um, I'm not sure what the other options would be with that, but, and then the sign-in sheet and such. Um, we've provided, uh, headquarters has provided to each area, two thermometers and gloves, and then each area um, has been replenishing that uh, as they need to uh, and such. But again, deal with your area director, your area leadership on what you need 
uh, and what's available and how, um, how to procure it or how to get it in your hands. I'm not going to read through these next two slides to you. It talks all through face coverings. And when we're talking a face covering for Special Olympics, <clears throat> while certainly it is ideal to have the double layer mask and so on down the line, uh, a mask or any like a, a, a gaiter or whatever that you can that you pull up is fine. You can't just pull up their shirt. It has to be separate from their clothing. Uh, but any of those are acceptable. Here's the gist of it for athletes and unified teammates uh, and then for coaches and other volunteers. Athletes, unified teammates, um, they need to wear their mask or their face covering on arrival through the whole first process. Once they start participating in the physical activity that they're there for, including your warm up and stretches, once they start that activity, they can take their mask off. Recommend uh, having folks bring uh, you know, a small Ziploc bag or whatever they can put it in and then shove it in their pocket or whatever, uh, as far as that goes, don't collect all the masks for them and give back. You just cross contaminated everything. Um, but, uh, but as soon as they've, uh, they start the practice or they start the physical activity, uh, they can take the mask off when they are done after they've stretched out, uh, they do need to put the masks back on for any kind of closeout and departure. But once they're done, the activity, um, is, uh, is when they have to put it back on. For coaches, volunteers, non-sport volunteers, et cetera, on down the line, essentially they need to be, have their face coverings on at all times throughout the practice with one exception. And that is when they themselves are physically engaged in the physical activity that's going on. So if they're helping, um, you know, uh, doing the stretches with the athletes, or uh, whatever, playing the bocce game, um, uh, or whatever, then they can take them off if they're physically, uh, if they're physically active with that program. If they're just standing around, no, they need to have their masks on. That's the in in what was that a minute? Everything was on those two slides summed up with that. Um, so you've got that. And see one final video um, featuring Mr. Joe Wu, and also featuring, and I'm sure he'll be sticking around and signing autographs our own Mr. John Bogaski, starring role in this video. As a coach, you have a critical role in ensuring the safety of your participants. It is necessary to adapt some of your coaching strategies to lead safe practices under Special Olympics new return to activity guidelines. Before each activity, communicate the need for high risk individuals to participate at home. And have all participants complete the COVID-19 participant code of conduct and risk assessment forms. Forms may be tracked in GMS if the program would like. During practice, it is important to maintain physical distancing of at least six feet or two meters between all participants. To do this, place markers on the ground to indicate what six feet is and have extra volunteers to remind participants to maintain their distance. We know it is difficult, but to ensure the safety of everyone participating, there are no fist bumps, high fives, hugs, or huddles right now during this COVID-19 pandemic. You can still support your friends and teammates by cheering each other on. All participants should come to the activity with their own supplies and cannot share masks, water bottles, towels, or uniforms. In phase two, the use of shared equipment is allowed, but should be limited. All equipment will be disinfected between each use. Wear face masks throughout activities, including arrivals and departures. Do not touch the outside of the mask. Do not scratch or touch your face. Masks do not need to be worn during active exercise. However, if sneezing, coughing, or yawning without a face mask on, participants should cover their faces with a tissue or elbow, not their hands, and throw away any tissues and wash their hands immediately. Throughout the activity, use verbal and visual signs to remind participants about hygiene, standard infection prevention, physical distancing, and use of personal protective equipment, or PPE. For 
more information on Special Olympics return to activity protocol and safety guidelines, visit resources.specialolympics.org. Oops, sorry. Or, or consult your local program. Okay. Cool. As a coach. Oops. So uh, just as a, um, a summary on that, um, uh, what we've gone through here, again, we've had those interactive webinars. We'll be doing some for the athletes. They can watch the recordings, do it in sequence, please. Um, it'll be useful for them that way. Uh, and um, uh, they'll be doing some live sessions as well. Uh, we'll share those as soon as we've got those uh, available. Um, for those sports where we have a national governing body, um, uh, they're providing some additional resources and, and such. I know for swimming, um, uh, USA Swim has been very helpful on those lines. Uh, and then also for our volunteers, uh, in terms of general orientations for volunteers, uh, uh, Sam Boyd, who handles that for here for headquarters, is going through a lot of these specific uh, things that are here. So um, with that said, I think, yep. So the next slide, I'm going to turn this over to Ryan. Uh, and uh, Ryan, um, you and, can take it from here. And this is Steve. Ryan, just before you get started, um, Mike, we did have a question come in. I want to make sure I was not giving <laughs> information. Um, the question was, if someone had already filled out the acknowledgement of risk form, knowing that there's a possible new form coming out, would they then need to sign the new form? And I said, yes, be prepared to do that. And that is the plan at this point. Um, yes, but we'll go through that with the area leaders, the area directors on, on Monday night. So there's going to be a lot of questions with that. Rather than getting into that, just know um, if you have bocce starting on Saturday or Sunday of this weekend, talk to us offline. But until then, um, yeah, just kind of hold it. And John, yeah, I, I, I think your best scenes were on the cutting room floor. Uh, I would really like you, as Ryan talks through this, um, I know Jeff shared with me some of your observations of just trying to teach bocce in that situation. I think that would be really helpful as we get to these questions, because you lived it already. So that said, I'm going to, I'll still be here, but I'm going to disappear uh, from view <laughs> and uh, go for it, Ryan. All right, I hope you guys are doing well tonight. Um, good to see everybody. So with me tonight, Rennie Springle, uh, he's somebody that I work really close with each season, has helped me uh, grow stronger with my bocce knowledge. Um, so we're going to dive into this here to kind of get our brain juices flowing, which the last video kind of did that for me also. So as a group here, feel free to unmute yourself as we go through this. It's meant to be an open discussion and kind of help your fellow coaches uh, in the process here, especially if you've given this some thought already. So what are some implications of the requirement for social distancing? So what came to mind for me, um, obviously a lot of the athletes come to practices or competitions to be with their friends and the social aspect uh, that they get from that. So just a reminder um, to not hug um, or any close contact like that. So again, you want to be arriving early. Set up, we found cones to be extremely helpful. I know that I attended uh, one of Melissa Anger's flag football practices and I was talking to an athlete. We started far away, but we started talking and got closer and closer and Anger's like, get on your cone. So that's kind of what it took for me to remember that. And I know that would just really help the athletes. So um, something else that came to mind was the games may take longer. I know that when we have to measure uh, how far the balls are from the Polina, sometimes if we have enough volunteers, we have two out there at once. Obviously, that would be within six feet, most likely. So that was something that I thought uh, may impact um, the game speed there. Is there any other thoughts um, that uh, social distancing may impact uh, bocce this year in your programs. You can't do doubles anymore. But yeah, I, I think um, there there could be some ways to do that. Not to speak on on Ryan's toes here or Rennie's toes, but um, you know I think there could be some ways to do that, um, and we'll, we can talk through that later. I know, I don't know what Rennie's, Rennie and I talked about this early in season. I don't know if he's changed his thinking, but one of the things that 
I was thinking about is not having the uh, PVC pipes because setting them up, taking them down is a lot of indirect contact. You just play on an open field, which you can do bocce on. You still got to get close to the Polina. Yeah, and it you know like like you're talking about, John. That that definitely impacts some strategies and some uh, techniques and stuff. But um, that could be an option for sure. And that may be something to incorporate into the return to play protocol that we're currently um, getting in place. That may be a step uh, at the beginning of the season to do. So yeah, that's a great point. Anyone else here? I think the other thing, I mean, if I look at our groups of 10 in Montgomery County, we've looked at group of 10, so it's two coaches and four, four athletes, eight athletes. They're playing four games of singles, so there's one referee is covering two courses. And then you have to wipe the plane off every time it changes hands. Are you saying you've done that already, John? No, we haven't. We haven't done it yet. I mean, we... Okay. Um, but, but this is, you know, we, we have decided that our, you know, the groups of 10 are two coaches and eight athletes. So you just kind of, you know, if they're playing singles, which is what you want. You got four courts and two officials. Yeah, this is Mike Janice. For the Polina, my suggestion is that the volunteer running the court just places it. You don't throw the Polina. So the only one touching it is the volunteer. It sounds like a good idea. Uh, Mike, I was thinking of the same thing too, just letting the volunteer work the Polina and place the Polina. So back to Steve's comment of there's different strategy. If you don't have the PVC pipes or the boards, you know, yes, it's a different strategy. So we'll concentrate on, on different strategies this year and different ways of playing, which for some athletes might be the right thing to do. Um, the, the other thing that we, we're going to have to take a look at, you know, if you have four athletes um, playing doubles, to spread them out six feet at the end of each court is a lot of issues and stuff. Or do you put like they do at Charles County's qualifiers, you put two athletes at one end and two athletes at the other end. And, you know, they go back and forth, but they, the athletes never move. That, that's another thing. One of the things that I picked up tonight that I kind of like is that, um, that rubber disc that was being placed out there. You know, we, we really need to be able to mark off what is the boundaries that the athlete, when they're not playing, are going to stay in, um, because that to me is a concern. And then we got athletes that wander when they're in there. They like to socialize when they're not playing. So we're all going to have to think: how do we define the area that they stay in? You know, we can't tell some athletes. You're not going to be able to tell them to stand on a one foot diameter um, marker, you know, like we saw in the video, you, you, you may have to put some string out on the grass and put it as a big circle and say, you stay inside the circle unless you're throwing the balls. And then, you know, for the balls, in, in my mind, you, you just make sure you have different colors. So the, and the athletes, they got to go back and pick up the ball. So the, the person doing the referee picks up the Polina and then the athletes in turn come down and pick up their balls so that, you know, you keep, you still keep them separated. So that goes back to what Ryan said, the games are just going to take longer. We're not going to be as busy. Um, and I think we need to let all of our athletes and their counselors, their families, Whoever brings them to the practices understand that these are the challenges for this year so that they can make that decision. Is this the year I want to participate or not participate? Because I don't know about some of you other teams. In the case of Montgomery County, 
we have more than 20 or we have more than 16 athletes that have already said, I want to participate. And based on the rules we have, uh, you know, 16 is the maximum we can have at one practice. So either we got to double practices or we got to find, you know, to see which ones can participate or not once they understand all of the rules that they're going to have to abide by. And I think what Rennie mentioned, I think you said that was Charles County and somebody brought up, we couldn't do doubles. I think that's one, it could, one way it could possibly be done is you have one member from each team on both sides or both ends of the, of the court. And as long as they're having their social distancing, I think it could work that way. So some of what we covered already here goes into the next slide. So strictly uh, with phase one here, what are some implications of the requirement of no indirect or direct contact? So again, sanitize and nabachi set after each turn. Um, I had a coach mention to me that they were going to get a bunch of different bocce sets this year, so they never had to wash them during a practice. Um, depending on how many athletes you have, that could be a lot of sets. Um, so that is an option if you would like to proceed that way. Um, and each volunteer will need to keep the same volunteer position. So whoever's keeping score, obviously touching that, that needs to be kept to them. Like Rennie was talking, um, the same volunteer putting down the Polina each time. That's a great way around that. That would be safe and avoid uh, either indirect or direct there. So um, anything else that comes to mind uh, for avoiding that? I don't have that, but I, I think, Randy, we could rotate the Polina placement for some standards to, to give them some different, you know, near and far, left and right, to give, to give them some different um, competitions. Absolutely. You know, so they can practice different types of strategy. On right. That was something that was included in the virtual training guide uh, on the website, uh, looking into some stuff. There was a lot of different exercises on how the game changes, no matter where that plane is placed, which I did not know. Uh, so that was kind of interesting to learn about. And obviously the reduced number of participants and courts there. So getting into how do you incorporate this to your program? I'm a new athlete, I come to your practice and my form is incorrect. Um, what would be your approach with this? Obviously verbal explanations away, anything else? You can model it, but this is what, uh, what Mar uh, Mike was talking about at the beginning. We had, when I was doing the video, we had an athlete who had never played, who had you know, has muscle difficulties and had never really played bocce and trying to get her to hold the ball correctly with from six feet away was just excruciatingly difficult um, and unsuccessful in the end. And, and you know, be, I, at some point I had to stop because she was getting too frustrated. And so I just let her throw it the way she did. But it was it was very difficult because normally what I would have done, I would, if I could have just touched her and turned her hand over. It would have made a huge difference, but she couldn't quite get what I was trying to tell her. Uh, so it's a challenge. It's a real challenge with some athletes. Are there any programs that aren't allowing uh, new athletes to the sport this year solely for needing? Montgomery, that's Montgomery, Montgomery is done. It's returning athletes only, partly for yep. that reason. Yep. Culver County as well. Yeah, I mean, if you don't have the basics, then you're either going to go out there and make up your own way, which probably isn't right, or teach others who are watching the wrong way. The other reason for that is just the numbers. We can't accommodate all our existing, all our returning athletes even. Mm -hmm. Yep, and uh, Kathy Ax Axline mentioned in there too that uh, Frederick may be looking at doing that as well. So you're taking notes. I want to make sure that you captured that one too, Ryan. I'm learning as much as they yeah. are. You know, it, how to restrict athletes or which athletes do we allow to participate? Because really, Mike's right. We're not saying to somebody, you, 
we don't want you to participate. So, and it's why I emphasized so much earlier, you got to make sure that everybody understands what the rules are and what the safety items are and why we're doing this thing so that they can make that decision themselves and not put us coaches in a position of where we've got to turn somebody away. Well, I'll add one other thing that we've um, added in all the programs in Montgomery County is we've required, the athletes have to have a higher degree of independence in order to participate this way. So in the example of bocce, they have to be able to go out and get their bocce balls and bring them back after they've rolled them. Um, and we have some athletes for that's going to be a challenge. And we got, we got one parent that's pushing back. Um, but we, we just in all of the sports, because of the, the need, it's not just returning athletes, but it's a little bit higher degree of independence because you can't help them as much. Um, and, and that's been part of our criteria for trying to make decisions on when we have too many athletes who can participate. Yeah, and that, that's kind of with every sport. I know we had the preseason with uh, swimming and the similar challenges with every sport. You're going to find some athletes that from the physical distancing, stand, physical distancing standpoint, you know, they, they need chaperoning or they need one-on-one -on -one getting in and out of the pool. And, and unfortunately, um, during this, you know, current circumstances, we just can't do it right now. Well, so. just to add to that, I mean, if you need a chaperone, that takes away a slot from another athlete because we can only have 10. Absolutely. And so we, we favor having maximum athlete participation, but that has eliminated some people that want to participate. All right, so at this point we'll move on. We'll kind of get into that a little bit later also uh, after these next couple of slides. So I kind of think of this as like the athlete oath with how many times the athletes say it, that's what this reminds me of. But again, no athlete or volunteer may participate in any manner in a Special Olympics program without a valid and current medical form or volunteer application or certification. There's no exceptions, uh, even with the phases that we are in right now to this policy. So some deadlines here to be aware of. So for uh, 5-3-21, at that point, you'll need to have your roster of your athletes, partners, coaches, and volunteers into GMS. Um, and same with that date, uh, every athlete must have a completed medical, which will be through the end of June uh, on file. Every coach, partner, and volunteer must have a complete volunteer application and protective behaviors, again, by 630. Um, and if you're a coach and volunteer, you must have your concussion certification through the end of the month also. If you have questions about any of these, um, they are at the end in the resource section. Again, with online, it should be easy to find. If you can't, reach out to me and I'll help you. I'll walk you right through it. Um, and then all coaches must have um, the sports specific certification complete through the end of June also. Yeah, and I'll just touch on something real quick there, uh, Ryan. Um, one of the things that Ryan will touch on later is there's a lot of unknowns, as you guys all are aware of, for um, summer games or bocce competition and not knowing at this point exactly when and where. We wanted to be safe um, to begin with, knowing that the possibility exists where competitions that are typically done, um, you know, at Towson for summer games. We may have an opportunity to extend that season based on facilities and availability. And we wanted to make sure that um, through the end of June, so we have those options um, if we need to prolong the season. So we didn't want to get anybody eliminated with a June 15th. And, and then we say, oh, we're actually going to do it next weekend. So we wanted to be um, open and make sure on the front end that everyone's uh, good to go through the end of June. Yeah. The other thing, uh, hi, this is Mike jumping in. Uh, if your area has a challenge with this, like you, perhaps you're not starting training until May 1st, <laughs> which is fine. Um, uh, it, you know, it may uh, affect what events uh, you might be able to attend. If you have a particular challenge along those lines, your area director can contact me, uh, and, and just me, um, uh, and we'll see what we can work out with that. So we just wanted to give some kind of a guideline as to when we need stuff in with the, uh, the hope of being able to have something comparable to a statewide culminating event, something like a, a part of a one-day summer games. 
uh, that we've set these, but um, there is some flexibility if there's a need to be. Yep, thanks, Mike. And with that competition registration deadline, um, that's still to be determined at this point. That may be in May, uh, May 17th there, but again, I'll shoot you guys an email and update you with anything uh, once we have an update on that one. So I'm not gonna go through these because I just told you pretty much what needs to be done, but here uh, is a great reference slide in case you ever forget. And again, um, acknowledgement of risk is for anybody, athletes, coaches, volunteers, um, anybody on site that day needs to have that form filled out and submitted um, ideally in advance of coming to practice. Some uh, programs have done uh, it in the way that you can't come to practice until that is submitted to the coach, area director, whoever, and sends it to the state office, which is a great approach, saves headaches on everybody there. So Rennie and I have been talking the last couple of weeks. Um, we still have some planning to do on it, but you guys will receive an email tomorrow about this opportunity. So what this is gonna be is similar to the discussion that we had earlier. Um, we're going to compile some notes together and then send it out to other coaches, but it's going to be pretty much brainstorming what um, every aspect of the season. So we'll kind of walk through before you even show up, what should take place on site, what we should do. Um, and I'll have an outline sent to you in advance also for that. But um, Renny and I will be having that on Wednesday, March 17th uh, at seven o'clock. My guess is it's an hour long or so. Um, this won't count as a coach's certification. This is obviously optional if you would like to um, kind of just educate yourself or maybe your assistant coaches that either couldn't be on that night um, or whatever. So once the slide deck is posted online, you can click that link or again, check out the email tomorrow, which will have some more details and then you can register that way. Is there any questions on that one? I'll just add something that I did in my, I, I use some, I've been using some of these virtual trainings in other sports mm -hmm. to expand the number of people in each sport that are certified to be assistant coaches or head coaches. I mean, it's, it's been a, you know, it, it gives you just more flexibility and resiliency in your, in, in your volunteer staff and, and the train, the virtual trainings are just easier to get people to do than having to drive somewhere else in the state to take the training. So I just encourage We've had good success in some other sports. I want to just encourage people that this is a great opportunity to jump on. Yep. Uh, the Did next coaching special Olympics athletes course, uh, which is the baseline course, is Sunday, April the 11th. Uh, and then we have a principles of coaching course, which is for the more experienced coach uh, on Sunday, March 21st. And all the links for that to register are on the coach resource page. Okay, but you're, didn't you say that this doesn't count towards the bocce coach training? Correct. That, the one that will renew your certification, I'm still trying to get a date uh, set for that one. It'll be roughly a month from now. Um, this is more of just a starter conversation to kind of get your season going and plan it at this point. But yeah, John, that's a great point. You're never going to be in a bind then if you show up an event and, oh, I don't have everything to be a coach. Well, but, you know, I, I have eight snowshoe athletes. I now have uh, three certified head coaches. Awesome. Very smart. All right, moving on here for summer games. Currently, the tentative plan is to have a one day event. Um, That'll reduce the numbers along with kind of allowing us to spread out our sports on the other days on that weekend. Um, so it's more likely no singles uh, or half courts will be offered. So we're looking at doubles and four person teams only at this time, but that does not mean that during your practices, you can't practice with singles um, or half courts. That's, that's a great way to run a practice. There's nothing wrong with that. But currently that's what we're looking at for summer games, doubles and four person teams only. Um, each athlete playing on summer, summer games needs to have participate in two qualifying in-house events. So uh, that'll be taking place within your county, obviously. I forgot to take out the, is this feasible? Oh, no, I did not. That was a question for you. Is that something that is realistic um, from what you've learned so far today um, to kind of have happen this season? And just to clarify for folks who aren't familiar with what an in-house event could be, 
that could be within the context of your practice session. Right. Um, that instead of your training for that night, uh, you have a competition amongst your athletes. So um, uh, just to clarify, if you're not familiar. Is there anybody that says that would not be reasonable to kind of have that be the baseline for this year? I would say we have comp the difference is if we have to have doubles qualifiers and we're, we're, if we're otherwise playing singles, that would be a complication. But otherwise we have competitions at every practice. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the one the one thing here to point out is no decisions have been made on the events, but I think the thought is knowing that we're going to have a one day event versus a two day competition and re, and social distancing and uh, probably not as many courts and everything else to get as many athletes involved um, in the hopes that we can hold a competition. Um, the doubles and four person team um, seem like an avenue versus singles where the you know, from a time in, in one day, you're not going to get through everything. Um, so that that's the thought process there. Um, but yeah, I think um, from a singles and stuff like that, when you're doing that at practices, um, as Rennie, we'll get to in a minute, um, how you turn submit your scores um, will be individually based anyway. So um, some good stuff there. So Steve, I think you need to look at what, what, we, what happens what makes sense based on how many athletes show up? Because the experience in other sports is that you're getting about half the athletes don't come back, like the group homes in particular. Yeah. Thanks, John. That's something I'll talk to the SMT uh, with as soon as I can. Here yeah, and that could, it, it could be a dynamic situation throughout the season as vaccines um, you know, the, that whole process improves. People may be becoming more comfortable and such. So, yeah, it's, um, it, it's going to be, uh, like I said, dynamic is the only word I can come up with for it. The goal is to have as many competitions as mm -hmm. possible at the end of the day. That's what the it, athletes love. It so. seems like a competition would take quite a bit of time, though. You usually only have about an hour allocated for practice. And it's, we have to get permission to come in and use the fields. So we don't have like weekends as part of that permission. I'm not really sure we can do new qualifiers. Yeah, I, I think as we were talking about uh, Janice, that that is um, a challenge that that's probably not just within your program, but could be with others. And um, again, we're all in this together. So we'll work with you and um, see what we can do um, in order to, uh, you know, hopefully get to that state competition, whatever that may look like. So I think just keeping the lines of communication open and letting us know what challenges you're facing, um, we'll work with you as much as we can to, to uh, get it done. Okay. My approach with this is I started note taking, but there's too much stuff. I'll go back through and watch kind of what all these questions were and then try to send them out within an email and kind of address what our final approach is um, and what makes sense. And again, it may be different for each county this year. We might have to work with you individually on that. Um, but again, we will, we will see what makes sense. All right, moving on here. At this point, I'm gonna pull up, um, I think a two pager here that Rennie is going to talk to uh, more bocce specific information wise. Pause this. Wrong sport. Nope, not yet. We're getting there. All right, how about now? Do we see a word? Yeah, document? but if you could just do one page at a time, because it's it's hard to read. You're asking a yeah, lot. Just right? enlarge it down at the right corner. That'll do it. Oh my gosh, 400%. All right, let me zoom out a tad here. All right, Renny, the floor is yours, thanks. Okay, folks, you know, um, a lot of you have, um, have gone through this before 
with us and everything else. So um, if you haven't been a, a bocce coach before, I strongly urge that when we offer um, the training um, later on this season that you participate. Um, but if, you, if you've been a coach before, um, I do want to go over um, a few items and um, I'm looking at the at my notes and the notes that you have here and they don't quite jive. Brian, maybe my copy didn't come out and I lost a page somewhere. Um, I, Is it maybe you're on supplement B right now? No, I'm on supplement A and I, I think I'm missing the first page. Um, there. Okay, official events. Um, as in the past, we'll offer singles um, and we'll offer um, traditional doubles and unified doubles. And the, I just don't see the traditional four person teams or unified four person teams. That just crowds up the field, but keep those games in mind. Um, <clears throat> athletes, you know, when we do have the events can enter in two events. So singles and doubles. Um, unified partners may enter one event, doubles or the four person team. Um, don't forget that there is an option on using uh, the ramps for some of the athletes that do require that. Um, please make sure that when your athletes uses ramps and things like that, or if they're um, Difficult, they have difficulty seeing and things and need help um, during any of the games and stuff that that's all noted um, when you turn in the registrations for those athletes so that we can have a record of that. The, the next item I really want to try. Hey, to hey, hey Rennie, this is Steve. Sorry to, sorry to jump in. It, it looks like you have the um, uh, supplement A from last year. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I um, don't want to cut you off, but I did want to uh, continue going down the path with some um, information that may not be correct. So I'll hit a few of these things. And then the one thing I really want you to hit on um, is how we get the scores submitted. So the, okay. the division. Um, so as, Kit, as Rennie was saying, yeah, in the past, um, you could enter uh, multiple events this year. Um, again, provided we're able to do a state competition setting, it will only be one event. And again, we'll be looking at pop probably um, the doubles, uh, possibly the four person, but we'll probably not offer the singles or half court, again, based on the limited space and limited time, et cetera, and, and getting more athletes to have an opportunity. So uh, we talked about that as uh, for, for a doubles competition, you would have two athletes on one end, on up, they would be from opposing teams, and their teammates would be on the other end of the court, um, social distance. And it would almost be like each one is doing a singles competition or a part of one, if that makes sense. So one athlete would be rolling the ball down, sanitize it, and then they'd be rolling it back, their teammates on the other end. So again, this is fluid as we've talked about and, and good communication. So but yeah, to get to that state level competition, we would just have one event per athlete. Again, most likely it would be in partners, uh, most likely looking at that doubles uh, format. So um, then, um, and then Rennie, I think that was the main thing there that I wanted to, to jump in on. Um, you know, we're not looking at the half courts or singles probably. So okay. um, yeah. and if you want to take over, I think the, the rest of it is mostly the same information. Yeah, hey, uh, well, one other comment, just so the folks know um, an option or an opportunity. Um, I can't promise that we can do, we can meet all requests, but we do have a fairly large stockpile of bocce ball sets <laughs> that are sitting in a, um, a trailer, not a trailer, a, a big giant pod along with all the, the tubing and such. If we can work it out, you know, if, if help loaning you an extra set of balls or a couple extra set of balls is going to make the difference in terms of your ability to hold uh, your program or whatever, we can work it out. 
we, we, I haven't talked to Steve and Ryan about this, but it's something that stuff sitting there collecting dust most of the time. Uh, and we may as well put it to use. We will need it back. Uh, we probably would need it back uh, whenever we uh, can hold or 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 co-host a competition. But um, so uh, you know, be aware where we want to do what we can to to help you all uh, with that. And it, it's limited in terms of how much we've got, but we've got probably Steve what at least thirty sets back there, something like that. Yeah, we haven't done an inventory in a while, but um, I know we've got um, a good number. I would say between. Yeah. 30 somewhere in that neighborhood yep yeah okay uh, yeah back to you Randy. sorry about that no 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 problem i appreciate you jumping in i, I can't read it the screen's too small for my eyes um tonight so I, i've got the big print paper in front um so the next item that I wanted to talk about was the divisioning. Divisioning is really important, folks. And I know a lot of us have different ways of doing it. There are some basic rules that we really need to, to keep in mind. Um, the athlete, first of all, all of your measurements should be measured in inches. Um, over the years, I've seen feet and inches. I've seen centimeters, um, I've seen meters and centimeters. No, nothing but inches, round it to, you know, you can round up to the nearest inch, uh, but please uh, make sure that that's how it's entered into GMS. So when you turn it over to whoever enters it in GMS, make sure they understand that, you know, that's the way it is and every athlete gets their own individual scores. Um, if you if we're playing doubles, don't add up to two scores from the um, athletes because the next thing you know is when you show up for the competition, those athletes will have double the scores that you think that they have and they'll be in the wrong division. And uh, so, you know, we don't wanna have to go through that. The, the important thing to remember is that you are each athlete must throw all eight balls at the Polina, and the Polina will be first set at the 30 foot line, then it will be set at the 40 foot line, and then it will be set at the 50 foot line. And, and the athlete has to throw all eight balls to the Polina. And then after the all eight balls are thrown at the Polina, whatever the location of the Polina, that's when you measure. Um, and the rule states that the three closest balls are the ones that you measure and that you record and turn in to the state because you're gonna have a total of nine balls that you're gonna record and it's the summation of those nine balls that's gonna make the score for the athlete. Now, what I do for my athletes is I also take the time to record the other balls so that I can get a feel as truly what the spread of all eight balls is at all of the distance so that I can understand what are the strengths and weaknesses of the different athletes. Um, and, and it becomes important, especially when I partner people, I, I kind of sit there and I do that judging. So when you do your recording, if you can take the time to record all eight balls at all areas, at all distances, you may find that it becomes a nice tool for you to truly understand your athletes. Again, I want to emphasize, you don't have to do that. It's, I do this and it takes me a lot longer to get through division, you know, getting the divisioning score. But I think in the end, it's well worth it uh, for me. The other important thing to remember when you, um, when the athlete throws the balls is that if that ball hits the polina and moves the polina, you are required to put the Polina back where it was 
where you spotted it the first time so that your the athlete is always shooting at a polina that's in the same location for all eight balls um any any questions so far on this Yeah, I would say just be, this is a free open space here, guys. If there are questions about how to get your measurements, um, now's the time to ask where you can follow up with, with Ryan um, at another time. But as, as Rennie stated, it's really, really crucial um, to have a fair competition that everyone does it the same way. Again, Rennie said it every year, we have scores coming in that are just so wacky, we actually call because we know it's not correct. Um, so again, if you have questions, just follow up with Ryan to make sure we're all doing it the, the proper way for fair competition. And then for those of you that are trying to figure out, you know, remind your volunteers, because I, I know most of the time we'll get volunteers to do this. And we've, most of us are coaches and we know how to do it. But when you measure the, the distance, you put the loose end of the tape up against the ball, the bocce ball, and you take the other end of the tape that you're holding and you put it on top of the polina and you measure it to the center of the polina. Reason behind that, for those of you who haven't done it or can't remember, and to remember to tell your, uh, your volunteers is if you bump your tape up against the polina you're going to move the polina that ball is just not big enough and heavy enough not to to move you don't know how many times and most of you have seen it in the competition at state games when you know we have to get danny or uh luch or somebody else to remind the referees the right way to measure at at the end of a frame so um Um, any questions on divisioning, let me know. Um, I'll go on to the next page. What's after this one, Ryan? I'll, I'll let people read all the fine detail. You know, I, I'm not a big fan of reading the, the whole aspect. Yeah, is there anything to touch on the diagram portion of it? No, that, that shows, at least from my perspective, it shows the 30 foot, 40 foot, and the 50 foot line. Mm -hmm. um, you know. And again, I think uh, this document will also be sent out with the slides. Um, so you guys can review that as well. Along with being on the coach resource page. All right. As of now, I'm gonna switch back to the presentation here, looking at the time. Do we see the PowerPoint right now? Yeah, not as a projection, but yes. I think you only have one slide left. Yes. All right, so again, we talked a little bit about the virtual training guide for Bocce. Um, it's an eight to 10 week training guide uh, that you can use for your team. So even if you do have athletes participating in person, uh, it's still another great opportunity to say maybe for new athletes, uh, like John was talking about, if they're not participating in your county this year, um, or anybody who just may not feel comfortable, it's a great option. And you can even give them uh, the information if they are coming to your practices in person. Uh, there's enough to keep them busy throughout the week and make them sore uh, to help them improve in the sport they love. Um, so that is online. I believe that the bocce one's eight weeks at this time. If you as a coach find any content that's not in there that you think other people should be aware about, let me know. Um, for Alpine, I know that I've added some extra stuff after some suggestions. So reach out to me about that. Uh, the rest of this, we're not gonna go through. It's more for you uh, to reference if you have any questions. Um, so the next two things, again, you're gonna be receiving an email tomorrow with this information. Uh, make sure that you sign up for uh, the course that Rennie will be offering on the 17th, um, again, and open to any coach there. Um, and then also be on the lookout 
shortly uh, for the coaches certification course for the sport, which will be happening shortly. Um, do we have any questions at this point? There's nothing in chat at this time. I, I do have a question from earlier. Um, the, and Mike talked about this. Um, if we're gonna be showing those videos to our athletes and stuff, and we talk about being able to take the masks off, um, I was really thinking with bocce because we really don't have a lot of strenuous exercise that we, we could sh or should require our athletes and volunteers to keep the masks on 100% of the time. Is, is that going to create an issue if I was to go down that path? Uh, Talk with your area director if that's something that uh, in your case, she, but he or she, um, is okay with that's fine. Again, that's uh, um, uh, well, I, we're not going to we're not going to establish that at a state level. Uh, Randy, Randy, she's sitting right here. I mean, she <laughs> says it's okay. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and we we did snowshoe. We were all running around, and they wore masks all the time, as did cross country skiing. Right. So I, I my assumption for bocce is we wear masks all all through practice. Yeah, that's your call. Yeah, we were able to do it in basketball, too, just for the skills. So, uh, of course, they like wearing it when it, being outside when it was 35 degrees out. So, so. You know, I, I can only think of one time in cross-country skiing where an athlete had to go off to one side, take it off to catch her breath. Um, but the rest of the time, the athletes j did just fine. So that's why I'm asking the question, Mike. Yeah. I, I just don't want to go down a path. So, Rennie, Shelly's saying, SOMA policy is wear your mask. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Makes life a whole lot easier on me. Yeah. All right. So at this point, we will conclude the webinar. Thank you guys very much for being on. Um, I hope that you found it helpful uh, hearing from other coaches kind of what their policy is and what's going on. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. Um, if I don't know the answer at the time, I will figure it out and get back with you uh, like usual. So thank you guys. I hope everybody stays well. Um, and I hope you have a great rest of your week. Yeah. And like Ryan said, you know, uh, we're all in this together. Uh, if you guys find practices that work great with your program, please share with us. Um, we're all in this please. together. So, um, and as Mike said, it's a fluid, um, situation and, and we're always adapting. So, we really appreciate you guys engaging with the athletes and take advantage of the virtual training guides and um, get people active, whether it's at home or at the limited practices. So uh, again, thank you guys for everything you guys do as coaches. You're the reason why Special Olympics exists to get the athletes engaged and, and hopefully in some competition uh, opportunities. And yeah. bring and your I'm, just, I'm just gonna say thank you as well. Um, and look forward to seeing you at uh, hopefully some competitions out there throughout the season uh, and at an excellent uh, culminating event at the end of the season as well. Bring your questions and suggestions to the March 17 coaches training. Let's, let's get a big exchange of ideas and everything on that day. All right.